and I'm pleased to pleased to welcome you to this fireside chat today. The University of Hawaii has signed an agreement with US Indo PACOM, and we have been expanding that agreement quite aggressively to include new and improved and deeper uh, programs for undergraduate and graduate students. And we have with us today some members of a course that we've developed uh, between UH and Indo PACOM, a mentoring program, uh, SOX 489. And our goal is to provide a deeper understanding of the intelligence community with um, curriculum and also mentorship opportunities for these students. So we have students both um, on our panelists and in the audience. Um, and we will be um, hearing from them a little bit later today. Um, I know this is a week of final exams. And so for you students, I especially appreciate the time that you're taking for this very, very special opportunity on top of everything else that you're doing. Uh, but we are all very excited. Some of these students are graduating. They may talk about that with you. And one of them is tomorrow giving her doctoral dissertation defense on the topic of data intelligence. So very proud and excited for these students to have this kind of opportunity. And I do wanna also note that joining us today are participants from our partnerships in the defense community and intelligence community, as well as Pacific Islands. Uh, for example, we have President Galvin de Leon Guatero from Northern Marianas College, which is a partnership university with us. Uh, so we're very, very pleased and especially honored and uh, grateful for, for this opportunity today. Yesterday, we had a very engaging discussion with General Paul Nakasone. He's the Director of Cybersecurity and National Security Agency. And he was over the moon to know that today we would be talking to uh, his boss. And so I am, uh, with that, very honored to welcome to this fireside chat the Honorable Avril Haynes, Director of National Intelligence. Uh, she's the very first woman in our nation's history to lead the US intelligence community under President Biden's appointment. And during the Obama administration, she served as assistant to the president and principal deputy national security advisor. She's also served as the deputy director of the CIA and she's worked inside and outside the intelligence community and was a research scholar at Columbia University and a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins University. And she's received her bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Chicago and a law degree from Georgetown University Law Center. So we welcome you, uh, DNI Haynes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm also very pleased to introduce my own boss, our very own University of Hawaii President David Lasner. He was joining us today and he will lead our upcoming discussion. Uh, President Lasner presides over our 10 campus system, which serves at times up to 70,000 students from across the Hawaiian islands, including seven community colleges, two comprehensive universities, UH. Hilo and UH West Oahu, who are with us today as well. And he is the CEO of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I know, uh, DNI Haynes, you've been reading about our flagship university, um, CIST, uh, our flagship university. We are rated among the top 25 nationally in terms of public research grants. Uh, we are a land grant, sea grant, space grant, uh, and sun grant university. And we have one of the most diverse student bodies in our nation. We are a uh, Asia, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander serving institution. And we also have the distinction of also being a Native American, Native Hawaiian serving institution as well. That dual distinction is quite rare. And uh, we offer a wealth of languages and an intimate knowledge of the Hawaii and Asia Pacific uh, region. Uh, so President Lasner has long roots with the University of Hawaii. Uh, he began working in IT back in 1977, and he has received his doctoral degree 
in communications and information sciences from UH Manoa. So he's a proud alumni. He was the very first uh, chief information officer uh, and vice president of IT for our university. And he now serves um, as, as our president. I, uh, he serves on various national leadership capacities, uh, vice chair of WICHE, chair of the board of the National uh, Association of System Heads, member of the board of East West Center and so forth and so on. So I am very, very pleased to welcome President Lasner um, to facilitate this uh, fireside chat and I'll turn it over to you, David. Thank you, Denise. Um, uh, welcome everyone and um, thanks to you and your team for uh, assembling this great session. Um, this is part of the work that uh, UH and US Indo-PACOM have collaborated on to provide our students with amazing opportunities like this one to learn and discover more about national intelligence and security. And we're so honored to um, uh, host you um, um, today to speak with us. Um, it's very rare that we would get the Director of National, uh, national Intelligence to join us. And uh, next time, as we discussed beforehand, we hope we can do this in person. Uh, but this is just a great opportunity. So thank you, DNI Haynes, for joining us today. And um, maybe just to jump right into it. Um, Hawaii is obviously globally unique in the sheer concentration of national defense and national security assets across the state. Um, there's no other place where the geographic combatant commands and the service component commands are co-located in one position, let alone one location, let alone one island. Um, and the defense uh, and the intelligence agencies have a very large footprint here as well. Um, we have one of four DOD security practitioner centers, the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security S uh, Studies located here on Oahu, as well as the East West Center. Um, we have um, well more than a century of very deep connections with Asia, as is evident in our people and culture. Uh, and our academics uh, program as well. So maybe in introducing what ODNI does, um, you can say a little bit about how you view the opportunity for the intelligence community given Hawaii's unique and concentrated national security environment here in the middle of the Pacific as we face up to uh, face today's challenges, the great uh, power rivalry and especially of course, China. Oh, that's great. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And as you said, I really wish I were there in person. <laughs> I can't imagine a better place to be, frankly, but uh, but at least I get a chance to talk to some of you. And I, I, I hope over the years that I'll have an opportunity to engage with a number of you. I know Paul had a phenomenal time to the class. He, he, you know, that he was in Hawaii and I wasn't, so I am, I am sorry that uh, yeah I wasn't be there for it. But he's he's phenomenal, and obviously you got in a sense the A game from the intelligence community. Um, all right, so look, I, I would love to just maybe just step back, you know, as you sort of uh, indicated, to talk about what it is that the Office of the Director of National Intelligence does, and and sort of how that fits in then to the China challenge, because I think it sort of gives you then a baseline to understand what it is that we're trying to do, what our mission is all about. And my office was set up, basically it was established in law as a consequence of an investigation into 9-11. You know, commission went to work and sort of said, why didn't we have the intelligence that allowed us to provide warning and indications to our policymakers to be able to prevent 9-11 in effect? And, uh, and in that context, one of the key findings was really that we needed to strengthen cooperation and coordination in the intelligence community, kind of bring together the pieces of intelligence that we had out there in order to bring together that picture so that we could actually provide that intelligence. And that is really fundamental to what the office that I have does. And, you know, if you've kind of looked on the website or you know a bit about us, it's a big intelligence community. There are 18 components including the Office of Director of National Intelligence. We have a wide ranging 
community and uh, obviously the National Security Agency that General Makassoni is the director of is a big piece of it. So is the CIA. So are a number of combat support agencies in the Department of Defense, like the National Reconnaissance Office and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and so on. But it, it, the list goes on and on, so to speak. You know, the Federal Bureau of Intelligence also has an intelligence component. So there's just, there's a wide range of things. And if you think about what we do, you know, a way to maybe perceive it is um, uh, we collect intelligence so that, you know, you may be a collector in our community and it's a very big community. You might be doing it as a case officer at the CIA and doing, you know, human, uh, as we call it. Um, we do human in other spaces too. You might be pulling images from the sky in a sense. You might be collecting signals, intelligence. You might be working through cyber. You're pulling together a variety of information from around the world. And you're ultimately then it, it, through policies, objectives, prioritization, the kinds of things that we put out, hopefully integrating that picture. So in other words, sharing intelligence across the community in order to provide an understanding as best we can of what's actually happening and turning that ultimately into analysis. And that analysis is then provided to policymakers, to war fighters, to operators around the US government to help them make decisions in effect. And uh, when you look at the law, if you happen to be uh, you know, needing to find some reading material to put you asleep at night, um, you'll see that there's a whole series of roles that my position plays. Integrating intelligence, so you've sort of heard a little bit about that, pulling these guys together, whether it's coming from the FBI or CIA or, you know, NSA or wherever, to make sure that we're putting together that whole picture. Setting priorities and objectives across the range of intelligence activities, being a steward of the resources, the National Intelligence Program is sort of the, the, the budget that we use to fund all of this uh, work, in a sense, and being the principal advisor of intelligence to the president, to the senior military, to the senior policymakers in our government. And it's kind of manifested most obviously in the context of the president's daily brief, which I, you know, is part of my job, go to work, go to the Oval Office, brief the president, and provide intelligence throughout the policy community. And, you know, one of the things that we focus on is the fact that you can be collecting and putting together the most exquisite intelligence, but unless you actually provide that intelligence to the policymaker, or to the operator that needs it at the right time in the right form, it's not actually gonna help, right? So a big piece of what we do is just trying to actually pull that information together in a way that is most useful to the people who are our customers in a sense, and so that they're able to use it most effectively. And so in the context of China, which is a huge priority for us, it is really an unparalleled priority is sort of what we call it uh, across the community. The pacing threat is another way to refer to it. You'll hear a number of these types of terms. It's pulling together an understanding of, you know, what the government is doing of China, essentially, and how they're perceiving the United States and what activities are they engaged in and where are they contesting us. And we look to the policy community to help us to prioritize the issues that they need to understand and then hopefully bring to them the information that's most useful. And, and from an intelligence community perspective, we're hoping always to give the policymakers an understanding of how another country, for example, perceives the United States. And if you were to look at, you know, what is President Xi's perspective right now? What our analysts would say is that President Xi is very focused essentially on being the world's most influential global power that essentially the Chinese government wants to change the international order in a way that is aligned to China's interests, right? They more and more see China as a rising power and they see the United States as a declining power. They perceive that we are trying to thwart their rise and they perceive that as they pass the United States in their own sort of frame for this, that there's the greatest potential for conflict in that scenario. And they have pursued a policy that is essentially, and they're quite explicit about this and you look at their public statements and other things that sort of um, are fully consistent with this. They believe that they have to essentially contest us and increasingly they perceive this as a sort of zero sum game 
where they have to contest us in all sectors, whether it's military or economic or in the context of diplomacy and so on, in a way that effectively makes it um, impossible for us to thwart them because they perceive that as our agenda in effect. And as a consequence, we're constantly in the scenario of trying to ensure that we understand where they are contesting us and try to bring that to the fore for policymakers and war fighters and so on so that they can actually understand what's happening and decide how they want to respond to it. Text in, you know, it's in progress. We are trying to improve. So I frankly view the opportunity as exciting in the sense that this is what we're made for in a way, but it is uh, but it is a great challenge. And it's something that, uh, honestly, it's a part of the reason that I'm here. Your university has such extraordinary talent. And I'm hoping that some of you will wanna come and work with us to help us think these things through. Uh, thanks so much for that. You know, we're um, one of the most diverse universities in one of the most diverse cities in the nation. And we've got a very long and proud history of uh, contributing to national defense. Um, Senator Inouye, of course, uh, was a war hero and a student here. Um, one of our professors, Jasper Holmes, helped break the Japanese code uh, during World War II to um, help defeat the Japanese Navy at the Battle of Midway. Um, how can ODNI and the intelligence community harness our um, really high-end and culturally diverse talent to benefit both the people of Hawaii and our nation and global security? It's a great question. I mean, honestly, you know, in order for us to do our jobs, we have to understand the Asia Pacific region. And increasingly, I would say that the Asia Pacific region is at the sort of center of gravity of global affairs. You have you know, 36 nations comprising the Asia Pacific region, right? They have like over 50% of the population of the globe. They have, I think it's uh, approximately 3000 different languages that exist in this region, right? And you're driving, you know, the economic uh, world order in many respects. And so it is, it's a space that, you know, the University of Hawaii and your student body as incredibly diverse as it is, and geographically where you're located, you bring perspectives that we need. We absolutely have to understand this region and to understand this region, we need people from this region and we need to be able to tap into essentially your understanding of the area so that we can then absorb that as we try to provide essentially, you know, the intelligence picture for our customers. Thanks. Um... So you've been a professor at Columbia, a physicist, a government official, an engine mechanic. Um, it's an incredibly rich and diverse career. Can you share with our students um, some of your thoughts about how your own career journey led you to become the nation's top intelligence officer? And how, how were your choices influenced? And how do you think about service? Yeah, so it was so not a straight path, I would say. It's really, <laughs> I'm sort of proof that anybody can be head of intelligence in some respects. I, um, I don't know. I mean, I would say a few things. I, I um, in a way, I sort of followed uh, my heart and people, I, most of all. I really, the subject matters that kind of led me into the intelligence community almost don't matter because the fact is, you know, there, um, no matter what your interest or expertise, there's a way in which it fits into the intelligence community. And, um, and if you enjoy solving problems and if you enjoy uh, exploring new topics and learning as much as you can, you know, in short order, you're gonna be attracted to what it is that we do. And, uh, and I've always found that, that those are things that have driven me in, uh, in the work that I've done. Um, but, but the thing that really makes a difference to me, I think the, the sort of longer I've gone on in my career, and I don't know if this will resonate for you, David, but it is that, um, you know, I can find a lot to be challenged by and interested in, but in 
reality, like what makes me want to get up in the morning usually are the people that I work with. And I really, I can't think of a more extraordinary group of people than, uh, than I've been able to work with in government and in the intelligence community. I mean, I think it's, um, it is really, it doesn't attract people that are interested in fame and fortune because you're not going to get either one of those here. Um, and that's kind of obvious on many levels. It, it's people who enjoy, you know, sort of working together as a team to do something that they couldn't have done by themselves and for a purpose that they think is worthwhile. And uh, and ultimately, those are things that drive me. And But being with those kinds of people, you know, who I get to learn from and work with has really been the path that I followed. And when I've gone from one job to the other, it's been... You know, not at all predictable, honestly. Uh, you know, I was a, uh, the national security um, legal advisor for a time in the White House and, uh, and had worked on intelligence uh, issues, obviously, in prior jobs, but also in that job, and, um, and had been uh, nominated to be the legal advisor at the State Department. And the president at the time said, you know, actually, I think I want you to go to the CIA. And I said, really? <laughs> like, why, why does that make sense? And, uh, you know, and sort of over the course of time, got pulled into it. And I just found it was extraordinary. And I really loved it. And I couldn't imagine having not done it now that I look back on it. And I would say for people that, uh, you know, are thinking about their careers, it is good to think about what you want to do in the future. I, I would not suggest that you not do that. I do think that's useful. But at the same time, being open to what happens and to what presents itself for you and being willing to take a risk, particularly if you know the people that you'll be working with and you, you know, there are folks there that you respect and like and believe uh, that there's something worthwhile to be done. It, it makes all the difference in the world. And those risks have paid off for me in a sense. Um, and I've been very lucky uh, just to really work with extraordinary people and to have others, you know, support me and, and help me think things through as I've had those opportunities. But I also really enjoyed, by the way, my time in academia. I, it's, um, it's absolutely fascinating. And even though it's a kind of a different way of thinking about the world and a different culture, it's, it, Oddly, I would say that it matches most the intelligence community than any other part that I've worked in government because you're sort of, you know, analysts, are, for example, you know, intelligence officers across the board, very independent thinkers. That is part of what makes them great at their job. And, um, and there's a lot of skepticism, you know, about what it is that everybody else is suggesting to them, which is another thing that makes you generally better at your job in intelligence. And you're all about speaking truth to power and in saying what you think, uh, you know, at every table in a sense. And it was, um, it's, you know, and you're fascinated by trying to fill out the picture in a way, whatever the issue is. And that kind of expertise and knowledge that's in academia are the kinds of things that we hope to, you know, essentially provide in the context of our intelligence. Well, well. So you're coming up now on your one year anniversary in a new job and a new administration. Um, what can you tell us about your priorities for your office moving forward? And um, do you see any special role for Hawaii to play? I do, but I'm, you know, this is, there's so many versions of this question, you know, and I, here, here's what I thought might be most interesting to all of you, and I was hoping you'd ask you know, something like this. It's just, I really think this is a kind of a moment of inflection for our national security threat landscape. And I'll, I'll sort of make the case for you and then kind of give you what the priorities are behind that. Uh, increasingly, we have just very complex threat landscape that is, that evolves just much more rapidly than it used to in many respects. And that that's partially because of how mobile we are around the globe, you know, things like health issues or, you know, a, a pandemic that occurs in one part of the globe quickly reaches your shore, um, or because we're dealing in a digital world where cyber attacks can occur like that. And uh, and I know, in fact, many of you are experiencing that right now, Hawaii. So, you know, that is one aspect of it that requires incredibly deep expertise to be brought to bear on what we do and highly adaptive institutions that are capable of dealing with that. We are in a moment where the distribution of power globally is shifting. And you know, that is in the context of 
we used to be in a kind of a bipolar and then to a unipolar and now we're really in many respects in a multipolar world and um, uh, and so you see that distribution changing but also with respect to non-state actors and a whole series of spaces where in a sense um, state actors are no longer the only geopolitical forces that are out there and you see a number of very fragile or failed states where you have that distribution of power shifting within uh, states. We are obviously in the midst of a global pandemic that is having extraordinary impact on our world. Um, significant growing global economic challenges that many regions are dealing with. We've got an urgent climate crisis that we're trying to manage. Nationalism is on the rise, I would say. Uh, democracy is perceived as receding in many respects. There's the growing rivalry that we've talked about with China, but also with Russia, with a series of authoritarian states. And there's a tech revolution that I think has the potential to really reshape uh, in, in many ways our kind of global order. And, and so in that context, what we're focused on from a threat landscape perspective, what are our priorities substantively, right, is a constantly evolving kind of practice. We do an annual threat assessment, and I come out and I talk about all of these kinds of issues, both the state actors, the transnational threats, you know, variety of issues. But the reality is that things are just constantly changing. And so as a consequence, when I came together with our uh, community of leaders in the intelligence community, what was remarkable to me was the consensus that, you know, in addition to saying that things like China are the unparalleled priority for us, what we really focused on were the institutions, the workforces, the processes, those types of things, the bones of what we do in a way. Do we have a talented and diverse workforce? And are we going to be able to not just recruit them, but also retain them, right? And that is going to be critical to whatever threat we're facing in the future. Do we have institutions that are strong enough and adaptive enough that they're able to innovate at the speed at which we are facing new threats and managing those issues? Are we capable of bringing in the extraordinarily deep expertise and integrating it into our daily work that's so critical on the kinds of issues that we've been talking about. You know, are, are we able to form the partnerships that we need to form, not just with state and local governments and authorities uh, in the United States, which is absolutely critical, academia with non-state actors, NGOs, others, but also across the world with our partners in other states. And, uh, and to take advantage of those and understand and learn from those partners and work with them on a regular basis. There's just so many aspects of essentially our resilience more generally that we need to focus on. So those were the kinds of things that we ended up indicating are our priorities for the future. So um, as you heard, I'm a, um, I started in this as a tech guy and we're obviously in a midst of um, really disruptive technological change, but you commented on how one of um, the ways you were thinking about your career moving forward was about the, the people that you were working with. Um, can you say a little bit more about how human relationships have been important to your success? And as you go kind of up the ladder and you're pretty far up there now, does it become uh, more or less important? It's a great question, I, more or less important. I, it's at least as important, if not more important, is how I put it. Because I, I think, to me, it's been important all the way through. And um, the thing that I talked about with my husband is that, you know, I think that when we're on our deathbeds, I know it's a, um, you know, cheerful topic, but, but uh, I suspect that the things I'm going to look back on and, um, and think about are most likely to be my relationships with other people. I mean, I think in many respects, they define so much of uh, who I am and, um, and mm -hmm. how much joy I get out of my life. And, uh, and in the context of the work that I do, I mean, there's just no question that um, when it comes to getting things done and to actually you know, producing an environment in which we're making better decisions, not only do I believe in process, which I'm a huge believer in, and I believe in, you know, sort of establishing uh, a basis for making a decision with the right information, because that's so much a part of what the intelligence community is about. 
but I really have seen the importance of the human beings that sit around that table. That you know, having people who are focused on uh, the job, on outcomes that are right for the United States, as opposed to you know personal issues or other things that are not acceptable to be brought into uh, those discussions. People who are focused on working together to get to the right answer makes an enormous difference. And um, and having colleagues like Paul or, you know, frankly, every leader of the intelligence community is, I'm totally blessed in terms of a set of colleagues who are extraordinary and, and very different and bring different experiences and perspectives to their work. And as a consequence, I think we are able to interact more effectively. And I'm, I'm sure that everybody experiences this, but I think Another aspect of it is actually promoting a culture in your own institution that makes people want to come to work and also bring the best that they possibly can. And I, I think that's you know fundamental to good leadership is really that you create an environment in which you can leverage the best out of people, and that's again you know part of of working with people. So yeah, but I I mean I'm also a fan of technology in the sense that I love science <laughs> technology. So I don't want to discount that, but. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, we're gonna shift now and um, ask some of our students to um, give them a chance to ask you a couple questions. Uh, first up is um, Frank Rogozinski. Frank? Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Frank Rogozinski. Um, thank you for being here, Ms. Haynes. It's a true honor for you. Um, just take the time out of your day to talk to us today. Um, really interesting topics so far. So um, hopefully this question won't be too monotonous. I did um, end up asking it yesterday to General Nakasson. Um, so sorry to some people at the program, we've heard it before, but um, the question is, when does a strategic competitor become an adversary and what are the red lines um, that need to be crossed for this to change? That's a great question. All right, so first of all, I should tell you, just listen to Paul. Whatever he said, I agree with it. <laughs> so I will definitely put at that. And please just call me up real. The, um, so, you know, he, here's an answer to this maybe that I suspect is not what Paul told you, but I will. it's a sort of a variation on a theme maybe, which is in some respects, the answer to that question is based on um, what policymakers often think is the most useful for them to pursue as a label in order to pursue their policy. Like, so, you know, this is one of the challenges for the intelligence community is that we try to put down our assessments, right? Like free from the policy and free from the politics and everything else, right? And then policymakers have to take it and translate it into what they decide is useful in terms of the response that they're going to engage in or the policy that they're going to design for this. And, um, and as a consequence, you know, uh, this kind of labeling piece becomes very challenging for us, right? Like, so I would say if you asked an analyst in the intelligence community, they would say that strategic competitor or adversary um, is not necessarily the most useful term to use for any particular country. What you what they would look at is on a case, on a sort of a subject matter basis, right? Like here is where they are acting adversarially, and here is where they are acting in a different way, right? So if you are looking at China, which is sort of the most obvious one in the case, right? Like from a counterintelligence perspective, they're adversarial. There's no question, right? They are going after us, they have thousands of folks that are focused on the United States on trying to gather intelligence on us. And they try to counter our intelligence in every place that they can. In uh, cyber, they tend to act adversarially, right? So, uh, you know, they're engaged in espionage in the context of cyber. They're looking to steal intellectual property. They're doing a variety of things in those spaces. That is saying, when it comes to climate, our interests align. They tend to be competitors, though, in some respects, insofar as they're trying to pursue clean energy and other things in ways that are to you know greater degree in their interest, as opposed to uh, with respect to you know where the United States wants to go for jobs or other things along those lines. But ultimately, they're also interested in uh, addressing climate change more generally. Just in a different way and on a different timeline than we are in many respects. So it's it ends up being more of a case by case issue, even though 
the reality is that those labels make a difference from a foreign policy perspective. In other words, if you label a country an adversary, right, you're sending a signal to them and you're promoting a policy that you want to use vis-a-vis -vis the country. And you have to then understand how they're going to receive that, how the rest of the world's going to receive it, whether they're, you know, our allies will say the same thing, how do you build it? So I think it's worth thinking about through those different lenses. I don't know if that's useful or not. Yeah, thank you for um, the answer. It's really helpful in understanding the topic. Thanks, Frank. And uh, next up, I think we have uh, another student, Billy Mitchell. Hello, Admiral. Just want to say thank you so much for sharing your insight, both with um, the intelligence community, but not only that, with a college perspective as well. My name is Billy Mitchell. I am a junior at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. I'm studying in psychology and political science. My question is, what future implications does the United States face with strategic competition with China through a humanitarian, military, and economic viewpoint? Big question. Yeah. So let me put it through this lens and see if this is useful or interesting. I, um, if you, if you take the frame that I gave before about sort of the way that China perceives uh, the United States and, and the sort of contest that we're in, um, a big part of the game in some respects at this stage is building up leverage in order to influence, right? So um, in the context of uh, a hotspot like Taiwan, for example, right? They're engaged in a kind of a hybrid campaign where ultimately what they're trying to do is put sufficient pressure on Taiwan to ultimately achieve unification of Taiwan back to China without having to use force. Um, but they're prepared. They've left on the table, right? The possibility of using force in the event that they don't think they can achieve it through other means. And, uh, and in that context, pressure can be in all of the sectors that you've identified. And, and so in many ways, part of our effort is trying to ensure that there is um, not sufficient leverage in a way that it closes or forecloses options for our interests and for our allies' interests and for partners' interests. And, particularly if you think in the context of, you know, our competition between authoritarianism and democracy, you look at, at places like Hong Kong, where they've effectively undermined democracy through the pursuit of their policies without ever having to use force in the kind of traditional right? Is, um, you know, we try to build up the leverage to avoid those sorts of scenarios so as to be able to push back at the right moment. So uh, an example will be um, uh, in the context, again, I'll just try to use Taiwan, I'll try to do each sector um, that you've identified, military sector, right? Um, it's publicly known that China has been doing considerably more sort of exercises and penetrating uh, sort of what are we call aid is like, uh, um, kind of uh, air zones, essentially, above Taiwan, but not per se within their territorial space, but coming quite close and um, uh, infringing on areas that are contested. Um, and in a way, that's a kind of, even though you're not, you know, bombing something, you're putting military pressure on Taiwan, you're sort of pushing them. Right by sort of saying we're here, we've got our ships, our airplanes, all of those things, right? And uh, and so we, in a way, contest those types of things through uh, presence in the region, right? So Indo-PACOM will have ships that go into that area, and we can even be more effective as we've done in the past, where we um, go through that area through international straits or other international waters, right, where we have the right to be um, with partners and allies, right? So, you know, the UK or Australia or Canada, others may accompany us, right? And, um, and so there you're not directly contesting, but you're nevertheless pushing in a space uh, to sort of push back against the idea that 
China is uh, in effect um, claiming the area in a way that pushes us out of it and puts pressure on Taiwan. So that's a kind of a form of military influence in a sense, in the same way that we see with Russia building up forces on the border of Ukraine and, you know, uh, and in occupied Crimea, right? Like puts pressure on Ukraine, even without having fired a shot in a sense. So th that's one area where I'd say you see this kind of um, competition in the sort of strategic competition in this space. So, you know, if you're in the economic space, you, um, you have scenarios where, and I'll, I'll use, you know, the Russia space, but it's very similar to the China space to give the example. In the context of uh, Russia, we have tried in a variety of scenarios to um, enact sanctions where we felt they have taken action that's unacceptable with our allies and partners in Europe, right? And one of the challenges in bringing everybody together is that uh, if you have a country that is dependent in many respects on trade with Russia, then they are less um, uh, inclined to engage in sanctions that may hurt them ultimately from an economic perspective, right? So one of the challenges is trying to ensure that there's enough diversification in a sense in different economies that you aren't so beholden to another country that you can't speak up when it is you feel that you need to speak up in order to counter certain actions that you think are unacceptable. Um, they're inconsistent with your values, they're inconsistent with the world order that you've been promoting, they're inconsistent with uh, you know, a variety of interests that you have, that type of thing. So it's another space where that's kind of the implication of that strategic competition. But I think just understanding that this leverage space is so important to us is, um, is just critical because it, it means in many respects that, that uh, in these actions, actually you need to be able to speak up early so that you don't end up in a situation, right, where suddenly you have less choices than you did when you were back at the beginning of what was occurring. Um, and finally, on diplomatic, it's similar as well. What we see is China is making an enormous effort to uh, actually um, pursue influence in various international organizations. And, uh, you know, when you look at the number of international organizations that now are um, where you have uh, nationals of, of, uh, that were former government um, or current government appointees and essentially in international organizations. They're moving in that direction. They're promoting, uh, you know, particular standards and roles that they believe are in their interest. And there's nothing wrong with that in a sense. But, um, but in many of these cases, we perceive, uh, as in the U.S. government perceives, some of the things that they're pursuing as ultimately trying to undermine democracy or uh, creating essentially that kind of leverage that I'm describing in a variety of realms, where you want to make sure that you're contesting it where you think it's unfair or illegal or somehow consistent with, you know, inconsistent with your values. So that's a maybe a very long-winded answer to your question, but if that's useful. Thank you so much. Once again, we all appreciate you here and you really went through all three of the aspects perfectly. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, next up, I think we have another student, Minara. Thank you, Alohodi and I. Um, Haynes, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Minara Mordecai. I'm a PhD student in the Learning Design and Technology program at UH Manoa. Hopefully, I'll be finishing tomorrow with my dissertation defense. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> fingers crossed. Thank you. Um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about the intelligence community's role in um, promoting President Biden's goal of becoming, uh, of maintaining and promoting democratic ideals around the world and how the intelligence community plays a role in that. And specifically, um, since the U.S. troops withdrawal from the Afghanistan, it probably has become a challenge for the um, intelligence community to monitor human rights abuses, if any, that are happening in Afghanistan. So I'm wondering um, how has has that been going? Whether there is, there are other ways that um, the IC community, the IC has been monitoring human rights abuses, and whether you can comment more about um, what's been going on there. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for being here, first of all. <laughs> Congrats on getting here. I'll think good thoughts for tomorrow. And and really to everybody, by the way, who's in finals week, I'm really sorry. <laughs> this is every time, hopefully. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So on your question, first of all, I mean, I think you point to a key area where the intelligence community is um, has a role to play in essentially promoting democratic ideals and uh, you know, and, and ultimately promoting policy work that's being done with respect to democracy, which is to say that by monitoring how it is that other countries may be violating human rights or somehow repressing speech or preventing people from engaging in collective action and things along those lines, that's a way for us to help the, the policy community ultimately hold accountable those states for doing that and, uh, and to bring that to the attention of the world and, and to hopefully counter those types of activities. But as you say, in Afghanistan, you know, our capacity to collect is diminished under the current circumstances. And, you know, for obvious reasons, not having forces on the ground, um, but the networks that we ultimately uh, produce when we are on the ground and not having those to be able to tap into in the same way makes it more challenging. At the same time, we still try to do the best we can at our job. And, uh, and we do continue and obviously you know, uh, during the course of, you know, uh, 20 years of being in Afghanistan, we um, have a lot of connections and a fair understanding of the ground there and it, and also uh, the Taliban. And as a consequence, we are still able to tap into many of those networks and to learn as much as we can about what's happening. And, um, and it is, it's a, uh, a pretty, obviously concerning the dire situation. I mean, I think um, from, a, um, from a human rights perspective, from a, you know, women and uh, um, we could kind of go through a whole variety of things, but like, if you want to start with the women's rights, um, it's obviously not a good story. Now, I would say that, uh, that frankly, um, Afghanistan has been a challenge in this area for a long time. I think even when we were there, uh, you know, it was 169 on the gender index um, from the UN Development Program. So it, it has, uh, you know, it was it was doing a little better than it had been before, but um, but and now it's doing worse. And uh, and so we do try to collect as much intelligence as we can, and we do bring that back, and we provide, um, you know, that information to the policy community and where were millions of girls that started to go to school in Afghanistan under the Afghan government. Now we see the Taliban foreclosing those options in many respects. And even though they have indicated that they'll let some women uh, go to school, it, I think we'll see how that develops. And it's certainly not going to be to the level that we've seen in the past. Um, and that will be you know, an issue, obviously, for policymakers to take up. There's also just considerable humanitarian challenges that they're facing. I mean, I think one of the, the Great challenges that we're watching right now is just the extraordinary uh, issue, just frankly, food security in Afghanistan. Um, there's, you know, I think the UN has indicated that there's uh, less than 10% of the population that actually has enough to eat at this point. And, um, and when you're looking at a winter uh, period and uh, the sort of cash challenges that the government of Afghanistan, which is now the Taliban, uh, you know, has um, under the circumstances and the challenges that uh, NGOs are facing in trying to deliver food and the UN uh, World Food Program and others, it's going to be even harder than it has been in the past. And, uh, and that is really uh, going to continue to be a crisis and a growing crisis for the Afghan people. So that is another aspect of the challenge that they're facing. And then, of course, all of the other rights that you know you discuss are um, are continuing to be increasingly challenged. So I would say yes, our collection is diminished. Nevertheless, we are continuing to cover these issues and the story is not getting any better for Afghanistan in these areas. Across the world, just more generally to your larger question, you know, this is something that we do um, on a regular basis. And you know, we've been talking about China and obviously uh, we've spent a lot of time looking at things like uh, 
in effect the Uyghurs in China and how it is that uh, China has been treating this like labor and a variety of other issues in that space. We've looked at um, challenges that authoritarian governments pose to uh, their citizens trying to speak out in political opposition and uh, promoting um, opportunities for the policy community essentially to hold accountable those governments as they use technology tools to prevent people or go after uh, civil opposition uh, in those circumstances. And, um, and then the other places that I think we can serve to be useful in sort of the democratic spaces, obviously in the context of elections. And that's an area where we spend a lot of time, I mean, looking both at the potential interference or influence that other countries are trying to engage in in our own elections, but also how it is that uh, uh, non-state actors and state actors are engaging in efforts to influence elections around the world and helping governments become more resilient in effectively addressing that kind of influence. So maybe I'll leave it at that, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Minara, and good luck tomorrow. <laughs> and um, I think we've got just time for one more um, pretty quick question before, um, and then maybe you can give us a couple of um, closing remarks and I'm gonna turn it back over to um, Dean Denise. Thank you, David. So we have a question from uh, Jason who wasn't able to join this call, but so many of us are interested in the answer uh, that you would give. And that really is that Hawaii and in particular University of Hawaii has just been a long um, time uh, leader in areas that are relevant for the intelligence community. And we wanna know your thoughts on um, what do you see happening here in Hawaii in, in terms of um, where the defense industry is going and gearing up and what are your goals for Hawaii and the University of Hawaii uh, in becoming a center of technical and political excellence for uh, the PACOM region? Thank you. Definitely. All right, well, I won't speak to the defense uh, sort of piece of things. I'll just talk about the intelligence community um, and our support in this area. But honestly, I am, um, my greatest hope for the university in particular is that, uh, you know, that we continue to work together in sort of having and creating opportunities for students to engage with us and to learn more about what we do and what kinds of jobs are available in the intelligence community. And part of the challenge for us, honestly, in, in recruiting is that because we can't talk as openly about what we do, it is much harder for people to get to know us in a sense and, and understand you know, what it means to have a, a professional career in the intelligence community. It's um, uh, and so having teachers or classes or opportunities like this and, and for you know, students to ask questions and get to know folks who have done it is really the best opportunity to understand what it means to work here on a day-to-day -day basis, what are the kinds of things you'll be able to do. And hopefully that piques your interest in a way that you know, brings us some of your incredibly talented students um, into our community. And I think, you know, if we've managed to hook you, the reason that we really want to hook you is because, you know, not only do I understand the just incredible expertise of uh, so many of your professors and therefore of your students as you're learning in all of these areas and the talent that you represent across a range of issues, um, but also because you bring with it your experience and your knowledge and your perspective from the region. And, and that makes a huge difference. In other words, you know, um, let me put it this way. There's, there really is almost nothing that you could be an expert on that wouldn't be of value to us, right? Like we, uh, we just did a national intelligence estimate on climate and we talk about a whole series of physical effects that are critical for us to understand that may prompt national security issues. And in that context, uh, we talk about uh, scarcity of resources, water, things like that. Like, you may be an expert on water. You may be somebody who's fascinated by 
uh, you know, agriculture. You may be somebody who's fascinated by um, storms or flooding or, you know, a whole series of things that, that you don't associate at all with national security. And the reality is we could use you in the intelligence community. And so, you know, despite what you may think, like any sort of area of expertise, if you're talented and passionate and interested in learning, like we're going to be interested in you in many respects. But when you come, what we're hoping to have is, is a community of folks that not only have those kinds of expertise, but also have, as I mentioned, like the experience and perspectives that are so diverse that allow us to then apply that expertise and kind of think about things in unusual ways, right? So in other words, um, I have found that, uh, you know, really almost through any lens of diversity, that one of the most useful things about it is that when you're sitting at the table and you have a really diverse group is that everybody will see the issue that you're talking about through a different lens. They'll have a different take on what's important or what might be useful or things like that. And, and as a consequence, that means we're gonna have thought through far more sort of facets of every issue and bring to the attention of policymakers or operators, war fighters, et cetera, those perspectives. And that's critical to us actually being able to provide, you know, sort of what it is that's useful to people at the moment that they're making the decisions that are critical for the government. So, you know, um, when you look at, like we, we've had, I was trying to think of scenarios that may be uh, helpful to draw this out, but uh, we've looked at, for example, conflicts, I, I won't be able to go into the details of it, but, but conflict issues in Eastern Europe. And, uh, and found that somebody uh, who, you know, had never studied Eastern Europe before, but had a kind of a different perspective on um, conflict issues in urban America, actually, brought to the fore an issue that they thought would be a game changer for how things might evolve because of an experience that they had with respect to urban issues in the context of, you know, how it would map into this conflict. Turns out they were dead right. It was sort of like a, a you know a black swan issue that you wouldn't expect to have really tipped the scales on something, and so you know having different perspectives is critical. But your perspective, coming from the Asia Pacific and in many respects from the different you know ethnic and racial kind of backgrounds that all of you have, you're going to bring that to our thinking, and that makes us stronger. It just makes us better as an intelligence community. It makes us you know, stronger as a country so that we're more capable of really understanding what's going on and bringing those issues to the fore. But it's also, it, it makes us be a place I think more people want to work. Like when I think about where I want to be, I want to be in a diverse workplace where I'm going to get to talk to people who have different perspectives than I do, because I'll find it more interesting and I'll learn more from the experience. So it's another aspect of it. I think if you come to the intelligence community, we'll be more attractive to talent across the country as a consequence. So um, all of those are things that I think are critical to what we're doing. So thank you so much. Um, it is very, very gracious of you to share this hour with us. It has just flown by, um, but I, I do want to just give you an opportunity if you have any um, last closing remarks for our students. Uh, I feel like I, I've uh, talked so much and you almost <laughs> bored out of your minds, but I am, I really, I just, want to say that um, if you are interested, uh, please, you know, reach out to some of the folks around you that, uh, you know, uh, may have contact with the intelligence community in Hawaii. There is a lot of them, as you have just heard, and as you probably know already. And, and also reach out to my office, to anybody else that um, I'm sure Paul would make the same offer and so on because we'd, we'd love to have the opportunity to engage with you. And, uh, and we really, you know, we want you not just because um, we want to, you know, train you and, and have an opportunity for you to apply your skills in our work, but we want to learn from you too. And we want you to be part of creating, you know, the sort of institution that you can be proud of for the United States. And I think that's a big part. You asked me at some point, how I feel about service. And I, I think I never really got around to that um, question. And I think uh, the thing about service that I found is that um, in many ways, 
it has more impact on the person serving than it does on anybody else. In other words, like being in service is, um, is really a gift because you feel as if you have an opportunity to make the community or the society that you work in and live in a little bit better. And you want the best people trying to do that and you want to work with them to do that. And I, uh, and I just encourage you, I, I'm sure all of you see things that you feel are wrong about your world and how they can be made better. I am one of those people too. And I just, I want to participate in the change that actually makes things into the better world that I want to live in. And imagine that each of you do too. And this is a way to do that, you know? So anyway, I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. And if we can impose for just 30 seconds, uh, we have a tradition here to take a photo of the screen with our uh, Zoom attendees. So if you can do this, it's a little shaka sign that we do here in Hawaii. If you've been to Texas, you, this, there you go, it. perfect. Okay, you getting this, John? <laughs> okay, I think we've got it. Take care Excellent. and um, thanks again for joining us for this and um, for humoring us. And uh, we'll look forward to the next time here in Hawaii. Aloha. Thank you. And good luck on finals, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.